1945, Schubert came across a group of uh, poems in something called a Poetisches Tagebuch by a very gifted young uh, German poet, not a fellow Austrian, but a German, uh, called Ernst Schulze. Schulze had won a poem contest by the firm of Brockhaus, which is still a famous publisher of encyclopedias. And Brockhaus had made a huge award to him as a result of a poem he wrote called Die Bezalbete Rosa. So Schubert's attention would have been drawn to this, because there's no doubt that he was reading um, Urania, which was the actual Brockhaus yearly almanac. Indeed, it is in Urania where he first found the poems for Winterreiser in 1827. So Schulze is a very strange poet in the sense that his poetry appealed to Schubert enormously in 1825. By 1825, Schubert had decided he was no longer interested in working with Goethe. He'd done as much of Goethe as he found that he could, and he wanted to find new poems. He'd also written as many Meyerhofer poems, 72 poems of Goethe, 44 of Meyerhofer, his, his Austrian um, compatriot. And he was now on the lookout for new poems, and eventually he would find Karl von Leitner, Gabriel von Seidel, and finally Heinrich Heine. But Schulze is um, mad. Not that his poetry is particularly mad, but he is an obsessive story and a pathology in literary history, because he fell in love with one girl um, who didn't particularly love him, called Adelaide Tuxen. When she died, he wrote hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines on her death, and then transferred his attention to her sister, Adelheid Tuxen. And I must honestly say this is one of the he writes again and again and again and again about a relationship that is somehow spoiled. The actual fact of the matter is it never got off the ground in the first place. But maybe that should actually show us that poetry is a question of fantasy as much as anything. In this very famous song, he writes about a spring day which is different from the very spring day that he had the year before, contrasting how much nicer it was when he was with her then than it is now. Because it's about a variation of time, everything the same around me but not the same. It's part of Schubert's genius that he casts the song as a set of theme and variations. So we get a theme and then we get a different type of piano thing, then we get a minore variant, and then after the minore variant, we get a combination thing where part of the minore syncopation, and it, it is a brilliant coming together, um, quite a demanding piano part, and, and also a demanding vocal part. Let's start it, and uh, if it, can I ask, because it's quite long, would you mind if I didn't, we didn't go through to the end? Um, at first, anyway. We will at the end, but uh, I'll stop you. Good. Uh, so. Oh, 
of rubato here which is not really required i mean would you really you know i mean i actually have to ask you i have to actually ask you uh, Jan, yeah. would you really in a beethoven sonata do that with this with a passage like that no 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 so i shouldn't no do no but why you see this is the interesting thing what what shame I mean, basically, Beethoven was still alive when this was written. And he was, and, and all of a sudden, we, we actually find ourselves doing dee, 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 dee. By, by what, by what standard? I mean, I agree, look, you're not the only one, and a lot of people think, oh, the lead is something separate from the rest of musical history. So, I can honestly tell you that it's exactly what I said about rubato. Also, what he actually wrote to us. That idea of picking. Möchten Sie besser auf Deutsch arbeiten oder? No, better in English. Better in English, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. And once I thought you started very nicely, but then you wanted to come in faster. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, one has to have, one must make a decision. Um, I think it's an andante. Frühling 
variation Schubert's writing yeah and this is where you actually have the conflict between the great composer who is writing <laughs> he's not only a song composer he's a composer who writes sonatas for the voice he's a composer who's writing at the same time symphonies and string quartets and things and in this particular thing um, Unending freedom. There are moments of freedom. It's always wanting to know where the freedom can be taken in Schubert. At the same time, it's not destroying a sense of historical accuracy, so it begins to sound like Brahms or Strauss. I'll tell you my theory of Rubato. In the 18th century, a singer's individuality was proven by ornamentation. So great singers chose to vary from their rivals by what sort of cadenzas they wrote and how they ornamented things and their ability to take a piece of music and add things to it um, reached its height in about 1750-60. Mm -hmm. By 1780 or 90, particularly in Austria, maybe not in Italy, everything was dying down as musicians began to take more control of what they wanted. Mozart was an example of someone. And then the advent of Beethoven, and this is a very important thing about European musical history. Beethoven represents a type of tyrant who said, what I wrote, nothing more, nothing less, right? And consequently, you don't get everybody adding cadenzas to Beethoven songs. You don't get everybody adding cadenzas to Beethoven piano sonatas. Yeah. Schubert happened to live at the time where the composer's control, where ornamentation had died down. No, not so much died down, but the composer had taken ornamentation into his control. So the ornamentation that you get in Schubert, da, 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 you, it's his. For someone else to say, well, I will now add it, this was not appropriate. After Schubert's death, we have Schumann, Mendelssohn. By the time Brahms came, and we're even talking about the 1850s and 60s, the new ornamentation was rubato. The new ornamentation was how much you can bend a song. You didn't actually write new notes, but you actually took with the rhythm and decided to be creative with it. 
In Brahms's case, it's so built into the music that Brahms' songs that are, that are just done on the page. Let me show you what I mean by that. Now, this is just a bit of music history to throw in. On the page. without that type of shape being wrong, right? But in a sense, in that period of Schubert's life, he was in that period a bit like early romanticism before it got overblown. So we're talking Keats versus Tennyson, for example, in terms of British poetry. There's a freshness and a reality and a simplicity about the Romantic style that doesn't yet allow for this heavy velvet satin brocade curtains of late Romanticism. So the simpler something is by Schubert, the fresher it is. It isn't. So actually, I'll tell you, one of the reasons why you did it faster, by the way, in the beginning was technical, because it's simply to do it's very good practice for you to be made to sing the song just at its ordinary tempo and to keep the line. Mm -hmm. Not to begin to then play with it. Because the trouble is that when we learn to play with music, we begin to play with it in a way that's, um, that hides some of our defects. That's one of the temptations when we, when we play with music. If we can just skirt over some of our problems by playing with it and appearing to be artistic, that's been a long thing. So just start it very simply and you come in at exactly the tempo he sets. Now why did you why did you why did you read there? This is one of the things about how a vocal bel cante line <laughs> displays itself, just runs out that way. And he's thinking, last year, your, your way of singing it is too hectic because basically you haven't got that, ah, oh, what is lacking? Oh, uh, it's a bit of yeah. You are sitting and you're still and you're thinking. And there's this wonderful music that only Schubert knows how to write that is a mixture of melancholy and sweetness. Nobody but Schubert knows how to get this combination of making the major key sound so sad. I mean, basically, 
it's also something that the great Italians can do. Bellini and Donizetti and people like that can make the major key sound devastating, the pathetic major. And by the way, Schubert learned a lot from Italian composers and also from Rossini, whose music he heard a great deal. But there is a, a feeling of um, you have the memory, you have the, the memory that's sweet, plus the fact that she isn't there which is not sweet. Yeah. And that's the combination. But in a way, you've got to be remembering. Mm -hmm. And if I was remembering something in a sacred spot, I was here a year ago, we did everything. It wouldn't be like Erstarum and Winterreiser, where he's looking for Angedenk and for mementos of something that they'd enjoyed, that they'd... It's, and then, of course, you've got the third verse, and, the, and then, you know, it progresses. There is more Unruh stuff in the Minore variation. But actually, this is such a challenge for you to just keep calm within just keep the line in that unfolding legato and unfolding um, andante. And you don't actually have to um, do as much as you think about interpreting it. Yeah. Actually, interpretation is... Um, Interpretation in Schubert is always so wonderfully inbuilt that if you do follow his tempi and his markings exactly and you have some idea of the meaning of the poem, it's going to work. Um, I, we don't have time to go back to the beginning. Can we just do the, the semiquaver variations, the one with the staccatos in the left hand? Not fast down. articulations, in my opinion, need to be heard. Before Hanenkor, before the great early music people, the early music movement was somehow leader people decided that it had nothing to do with it. But to my opinion, this idea that leader exists in a sort of a nice, comfortable, overpedaled bubble is absolute nonsense. I mean, basically, Schubert is a composer who pays a lot of attention to articulation. 
he would have spent his entire childhood studying Bach preludes and fugues on an instrument that had no pedals. And just at a time now when there are many, many people, Schiff amongst them, playing entire Bach pieces without any pedal. And that's a matter of discussion. Mary Pariah uses more pedal. Angela Hewitt doesn't use any. But the fact of the matter is that everyday use of the pedal as a reflex mechanism was nothing that came about until about 1830. That's when Charles Rosen says that the pedal became a default setting. Until then, it was a coloristic agent. How many times in the song Ganymede? Do you know the song Ganymede? Yeah. It's written with staccato on the left hand. And so, I, so many times I've heard the first note staccato. shouldn't use any pedal, but you have to learn to get legato. Okay, so can I honestly say you? that if you use less pedal also, that the balance is so much better, that you hear the consonants <coughs> of the singer. In this particular instance, one's got to learn to rely on making the sound against the keys so that there is a tactile, sensual pleasure at making a condom-free sound next to the keys. You don't have your fingers covered in condoms you actually have the pleasure of feeling the piano keys making the sound you're making. The pedal is a type of um, <laughs> intervening rubberizing agent in a way. It provides safety, certainly, <laughs> in more ways than one. But it's a sort of, it's, it's an incredible, it's, it's, pedaling can provide translucency, beauty, atmosphere, color. But it's a bit, we, when we have it on automatic pilot and we begin to put it even when there are rests show, <laughs> and when there's obvious light and air and, and, and gaps in the music that require that, that brightness, that lightness, that, that transparency. It's just, unfortunately, you see, um, what happened in the world of performance in Lida is that everybody, once we got to about 1890, when some of the first gramophone records of Lieder were made, we were right in the middle of the Brahms, Rega um, period, where everybody was massively rubatoing and massively playing around with the music. And when you hear that, people say, there you see, early singers, that's how they used to do it. No. That's how they used to do it in 1890, not in 1820. And there had been a sea change since Schubert's chain. You can't just say that all old records, we have no records made in 1820, but I can assure you if there had been records of 1820, and Schubert's own piano playing, sta uh, piano playing sty style 
um, is absolutely described by Zonleitner, his great friend, as strict, rhythmical, non, not diverting. He isn't. He, uh, and these people who were Schubert's friends went to recitals into the 1850s and 60s as old men and heard things that they said, but the spinning wheel can't stop in the middle, a horse ride like Earl King can't come to a halt in the middle. In other words, what was happening is that they were hearing incredibly rubatoed performances that were just playing fast and loose with the Schubert style. And the trouble is that in those days, all rubato became, if you actually were doing modern rubato, you made all the music in the world sound that way didn't occur to people then to say, well, let's do this early music in a different way. That's something that came about in the 20th century when people said, let us do early music with less pedal, less rubato, at other braver tempos. That took a musicological exploration, which was very much less understood at the end of the 19th century. Can you go um, from the minore to the end now? sensitivity and it's clear that this music means a great deal to you and that you love it yes. but the point is that you must learn to also love the simplicity of the line exactly as Schubert wrote it just because it's easier to go da 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 rather than da 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 it's actually it's really like calisthenics it's like Going back to the gym, you know, I mean, it's the yeah, musical yeah. gym of the mind rhythm. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't want to tell you what the famous Rudolf Pierne said to a friend of mine. <laughs> so, just in case you think I'm being a little bit too sharp, you should know there are people who are sharper. Tell your mother to get yourself a box of rhythm for Christmas. <laughs> you don't, but I mean, actually, and you have got a nice accompaniment. The accompanists are helpful people. They want to help you. And he goes with you when you lead. 
but I wouldn't. I would say, no, no, I'm not going to suddenly go faster because you're deciding that you're going faster, because you're going faster is not an interpretative choice. It's just to cover up something that's a bit awkward for you to do technically. Mm -hmm. So actually, what you need to do is not fast. fall in love with simplicity and just, you know, it's an old trick. Try performing this with the metronome on your own, without a piano, and see where you are suddenly hurrying. Dia, dia. And when you do that, you'll suddenly find that the whole thought of a man, stillsitzig, at no point does he stand up and start dancing. The whole of the song takes place as a meditation from a seated position, as he remembers. And my goodness, you don't suggest that man going like this. center and calm in your singing. But it's touching your, your devotion to the music and it's, uh, and it's a great song. It's also one of the most difficult ones. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.